is Castle One. Brace off for speaking. Raptor coming here, pressure coming. We're 1.5 below. 1.5 below. Two guys here, boys. We're looking at 10.5 to 42. Hello, podcast listeners. Thank you for tuning in. We've got another bumper edition of the podcast for you this month. We'll be talking about one of my favorite races, the longest endurance race there is, the phenomenal solo non-stop sprint around the planet that is the Vendée Globe. Before we get into it, a big thanks for all your feedback and your comments on the podcast. We had loads of messages about our chat with Tracy Edwards. So if you did get in touch, thank you for your kind words. It seems Tracy is a very popular lady. She's a fantastic storyteller too. It was great having her on. If you like what we're doing on the pod, do please give us a like and leave a comment. We try our hardest to get news of the podcast out far and wide, but I still get messages from people saying they've only just found it. So if you're a new listener, welcome along. If not, tell your friends all about us. If you've listened to most of the podcasts, you will know by now that one of the beautiful things about the sport of sailing, one of the things that we love as broadcasters, is its incredible variety. The wealth of different stories out there from all the diverse disciplines there are in the sport. And you will also know that one of my favorite races for that very reason is the Vendée Globe. If you know all about it, then excuse me for a minute while I explain just why we love it so much and give a little of the backstory of the race. Back in 1989, a fleet of 13 sailors took off around the world from northwest France in a new non-stop race from the town of Le saint -Delon. They were taking part in the inaugural edition of what would become the Vendée Globe. Amongst their number, Louis Perron, Alain Gortier, and the eventual winner, Titois Lamazou. Sailors who now rank as giants of offshore sailing. The first boat made it home in just over 109 days, and the race captured the imagination of the nation. 30 years later, and the race has seen seven further editions. It's raced every four years, and it still boasts a brutal attrition rate. Historically, 46% of entrants into the race didn't make the finish line. The last edition, won by Armel Leclerc, saw a new record, the 24,000 miles covered in just over 74 days. But this edition is poised to be one of the most exciting yet, and the reason is of course foils. The Vendée is raced in 60 foot Imoka class monohulls, a constantly evolving open class of super powerful offshore race boat that has fully embraced foiling technology. Of the 33 starters in this edition, 19 entrants are running foils. Eight of them are brand new, new generation foilers designed with one thing in mind, to win the toughest race there is. Now, we can't obviously interview all 33 entrants, and while our original plans had us traveling to La Sab for the wonderful race start, we've had to put the brakes on that in favor of bringing you six interviews over two parts with six key players in the race. In part two, we talk to Boris Herman and Charlie Darlin and catch up with Vondi veteran Sam Davies. But in this part, we talk to leading yacht designer Juan Kumajan, Juan K, about the peculiarities of designing for the Vendée Globe. We talk to Vendée first-timer Clarice Kremer, but we kick things off with British Vendée legend Alex Thompson. I hope you enjoy the time I spent with the 2020 Vendée Globe. Sometimes you feel yourself fully in the air. There are lots of times where you can't walk, you know, you're crawling around the boat. I would be surprised if this boat couldn't go around the world three or four days quicker than the last one. 
Our first guest is no stranger to the Vendée Globe. At 46 years old, Alex Thompson has spent almost half a lifetime chasing the elusive Vendée crown. His record is quite remarkable. Since 2004, he has been a fixture in the Vendée fleet, which makes this edition his fifth, a feat in itself that is impressive and reveals a steadfast dedication. His race record bears out the greater race attrition rate. From four previous starts, he boasts a second place, a third place, and two non-finishes. But as remarkable to me has been Alex's team setup. In France, the Vendée is huge, and several big companies have run multi-race campaigns. But as a British skipper, that's a tougher ask. Alex, though, has run an innovative campaign and from the get-go has entered the Vendée with sponsor Hugo Boss. Each edition has seen him at the forefront of design with a new and always progressive boat. And as he again takes to the start line attempting to be the first Briton to win the race, he very definitely sits amongst the favourites. We interviewed Alex online from his base in Portsmouth and I kicked off by asking just why the Vendée has been such an obsession for him. Yeah, hi, Shirley. Good to, good to speak to you. Good to see you. Haven't seen you for ages. Um, yeah, this Vendée has been a bit of an obsession in some ways for me. And I think it's there's, there's four reasons why I do it. There's um, the challenge, you know, wh whichever way you look at it, no matter how many times you do it, it's such a big challenge to sail around the world on your own without assistance. Um, there's there's a competition to be in a race that's 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 12 weeks. It's the right kind of thing for me. I, I, I really enjoy it. Um, I love that feeling of being on the ocean and not being able to see land and, you know, having the perspective of how actually how small and insignificant we are as a human race. So, and the last bit is, you now I, I get to spend six million quid on a, on a boat that's my the best toy in the world. And it's so ostentatious because it's designed for me, my weight, my philosophy, you know, every single part of it. And it's such a privilege to be able to do that. There's no doubt you have a badass boat, Alex. And, but we'll talk a bit about that in a second. I filmed uh, the finish of your last Vendée. After that race against Armel, 74 days racing each other at sea, and he was just 16 hours uh, ahead of you. I mean, much was made of whether you'd go again. How easy a decision was that to take it on once more? Yeah, that decision was made uh, before the finish, actually. The, uh, I phoned my wife up. Uh, I was about six miles from the finish line. And I phoned her up and I said, listen, babe, you know we agreed that this was the last one. Well, I can promise you the first question at the press conference is going to be, am I going to do it again? And she said, well, you, you know, you came third. You now come second. It would be almost criminal if you didn't go again. So if you want to go, I'll, I'll support you all the way. She knew what she married. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, I think it's really hard for, harder for the, you know, the families than it, than it is for our skippers. You know, we're kind of living our dream and what we do and what we feel comfortable and of course, but of course, we leave people in the position where, you know, they're at home wondering what's happening, what's going to happen next. And, it, you know, it's a real stressful experience for the families. And it's taken me a long time to realise that. But, um, you yeah, know, that's that's the truth of it. So it certainly makes me feel a bit differently about it. Well, let's talk boats, Alex. There's been a lot of chat about your new boat, one of the very newest in the fleet. First of all, how happy are you with her and just describe for our listeners what she liked to sail. Well, you know, Hugo Boss is, is uh, for us, the culmination of nearly 20 years. And with this boat, we, you know, we, we felt that we, we had the confidence to make some bold decisions that perhaps we wouldn't have made before. You know, you, you have to remember that once the thing is built, once a boat like this is built and it's 50,000 hours to build and 6 million quid, you know, if you've made it, if you got it wrong, it's a very expensive mistake. And it's probably not, you don't have time to to, uh, uh, to to make it right. So, you know, this time we were very bold and and ultimately uh, I'm happy as Larry. You know, I couldn't be happier to have a boat where, you know, I'm, I'm protected, I'm safe, I feel safe, I still feel secure. As a as a human, it's it's much easier to work at 100% because you're not, you're not being hit by waves and you're not wet, you're not cold. So uh, from that side, it's it's made a, a big difference in the, the feeling when these things are flying along and, you know, you've, you've got the traditional sound of a boat going through the water. 
and then that sound then disappears when you get going and you start foiling and and you know sometimes you feel yourself fully in the air and it and it's an it's an odd feeling but um you know you 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 know to be on a on a monohull where you physically feel the acceleration is is um you know it's amazing really it's uh it's something that gives me a real buzz and and you know when i started 20 years ago you know it would be occasionally in a Vendée globe you might reach 30 knots and now we can you know with 17 knots of wind we can go more than 30 knots so it's been a massive change since when i started well, let's talk a bit more about that your energy for this race has meant you've really been at the forefront design wise with new boats for each campaign i think so you've you've really seen the the progression of uh, of the amoka 60s how big a performance leap are we seeing this time around? How much better is your newest design? I think if you were to take the two boats and stick them on flat water, there would be a significant difference between them. Um, you know, in, in in every respect, you know, perhaps upwind, you know, upwind in, in Archimedes mode, so not foiling, you know, perhaps it's quite small. But apart from that, you know, BMG downwind, we're looking at 10, 15% up from where we were last time and that's pretty much across the board in flat water but then when you go in the ocean and we've got waves and ventilation and air going up and down the foils the differences are smaller so it, it very much will depend on in this race of you know, how much um uh how much wind we're going to have and and what uh, what the what the sea state is going to be but I, I would be surprised if this boat couldn't go around the world three or four days quicker than the last one Specifically, Alex, let's quickly talk foils. In in the America's Cup, foil shape, foil size, it's a big deal, isn't it? What are your thoughts on the shapes and size of the foils across this Vendée fleet? Well, it's, it's a fascinating time because you know, everybody's got their own thoughts on the foils and we've actually got, I don't know, four or five different conceptual designs and nobody really knows which one's right or which one's wrong. Um, and, and that's fascinating. It's great to have, you know, other designers involved and other schools of thought, but it's terrifying in some ways because, you know, you're, you're desperately hoping that you've made the right choice. Now, when we when we went on to this cycle, you know, we could only we can only really work from what we had before. And I think last time most people would agree we had the reference in Mocha that was perhaps or definitely wasn't the fastest upwind but was the fastest downwind and that was the platform that we developed from um and we obviously we, we're sat um over here in gosport in the uk and every other competitive team is is out in france in pont la or in lorient so they're all together they all train together they all know what each other can do and and we're kind of out here on our own and sometimes it's a bit scary to not really know what the others can do or not do on the other hand, it must be pretty scary for them as well, not knowing what we can or we can't do. But for sure, you know, this boat is faster downwind than than the last one. And we feel that we've got more knowledge, we've prepared more, uh, we're significantly further ahead than where we were four years ago. So, you know, it feels a bit nerve wracking not to know. But on the other hand, you know, we've got to stay strong and confident and, you know, no, you know, stay, you know, not get freaked out by that. You know, we, we know where we were last time. And we now know where we are relative to that. And, if, and that, if you look at that on its own, we're in a really good place. Is it fair to say there's a degree of mystery around your design? I mean, you've not lined up against the other Imokas. Boat-wise, you're very much the unknown quantity. Is that intentional from your team? Um, not really, no. I mean, uh, this time, obviously, we did the Jacques Vard. And, um, you know, nobody can say we were unknown then because... You know, I think we part, went past the Pevia going downwind two knots faster. So I'd be surprised if they didn't take note and uh, and, and realise that we had some, some speed there. We had planned to do the Newark Vendée, but, but that obviously got canned. And, and the Vendée Arctic, uh, Imoka did a great job of, of replacing that race. But for us, you know, we'd, we'd repaired the boat, we'd had lockdown, and we just weren't ready to be... Uh, for me, racing solo. I, I was I was actually doing my started my solo qualifier at the same time, and I didn't feel comfortable to to do a you know proper race, having been the first time I sailed the boat solo. Then after that, really, the only event we could have gone to would have been the Azimuth Challenge, 
And for us as a team, that would have been a week out of the equation. We'd have faced quarantine issues. And uh, and we felt at that point, you know, it's September. Let's say we find out we're slow or, you know, we have a problem in some areas. You know, the reality is there's nothing we can do about it. It's too late. So, you know, stick with your plan, stay confident, be bold and continue and, and use that week to learn, you know, more, more in the ocean than you would have done sat in L'Oreal. I think from your very first Vaughn day, when I've interviewed you, there's been chat about the physical management of this race, of how to manage, you know, making decisions and looking after yourself. Do having foils impact on this at all? And what are the implications of racing with foils on just how you look after yourself? Yeah, I mean, the, the foils with the boats, semi-flying, and, you know, sometimes they're fully flying, but a lot of the time they're semi-flying. Yeah, um, it, it does, it, there's a plus and a negative, I guess. The plus is that you've got a, you've got um, this wing that sits out the side of the boat and the power, the writing moment and lift that it provides is relative to your speed. So in the old days with no foils, you'd get a gust of wind and the boat would lean over and it's trying to accelerate, but it can't really. So you'd have to rush up on deck and ease the main sheet. Whereas now often the, the boat will see a gust of wind, it'll lean over a bit, it will start to accelerate. And as it accelerates, it produces more writing moment, more stability. So sometimes it feels like you can, you can let it do more by itself. On the other hand, as soon as you start flying, you know, you could see your boat three or four meter bow. We measure, we have a device that measures the uh, ride height at the front of the boat. And, you know, often it um, can be three or four meters in the air. So that means that you're going to be going, it means the ride is an awful lot more bumpy than it ever has been before. And there are lots of times where you can't walk, you know, you're crawling around the boat, you know, there's, there's safety issues, it's harder to sleep, it's a lot less comfortable. I think I've had uh, someone told me that uh, the old teams are way more comfortable. I mean, obviously very stressful because uh, if you capsize, you never come back up again. But, you know, it's a much more comfortable ride than, than these in Mockers are. So I think that's one of the toughest things is going to be able to, how do you manage yourself, be fast and, and make sure you get enough sleep and stay safe? We've seen pictures of, of sailors wearing helmets down below. I mean, just, just describe how, how kind of brutal it is to, to live in the machine. I mean, uh, you know, to be honest, the, the jump from the last boat to this boat it probably is less for us than anybody else because we were much more of a flying machine four years ago. So we, you know, we knew what to expect and what it would be like. Um, so it's, you know, you, you, you just have to manage it. You have to get used to it. Um, you know, your, your senses, so you have to be able to control your senses because your senses are screaming at you that this is not acceptable. And, you know, how do you expect me to sleep when this is going on? And, you know, uh, can the hull really take that kind of punishment? But, um, you know, so you have to manage that. And, and with us, you know, we've now got, I think, 320 sensors on the boat. Not all of them I look at, but there's an awful lot of stuff that I can look at now that helps me manage, you know, what's going on. So, for instance, we we uh, I can manage the slamming through the accelerations, and we now have fiber optics in the in parts of the hull that now give me, you know, a live readout to the kind of punishment that I'm giving it. Um, you know, the reality with these machines now is that you could destroy the hull, you can destroy the foils, and you can destroy the mast. It's it's um it's certainly possible and so you have to manage within all those um you have to have the boundaries and if you don't then you will you will break things so i think it's there's there's more harm that can be done now from the from the sailor and there's more management that needs to be done and the boats are more on the edge than they've ever been as we said this is your fifth attempt the statistics of this race are brutal and unfortunately, numerically, you're spot on numbers wise in that this race has a 50% attrition rate. Across its eight editions, you've started four times, finished twice, a third and a second, as we said. How much pressure are you feeling this time? Even looking at your stats, it could be said that success really for you will only be the win. Is that fair, Alex? Yeah, in some ways, yeah. I mean, obviously a third and a second. I mean, the, what an amazing story it would be, eh, to be first. Uh, but on the other hand, Shirley, you you know, I kind of feel sometimes it feels just a bit arrogant to, to talk about winning the race. You know, it's such a, 
you know, when you, when you when I look at people, and in the last one day, my hero was uh, Nandor Far. You know, he was, you know, he's a, a guy who did the first one day. He then, at mid sixties, decides he wants to do the next one. He, he didn't go and buy a design. He designed his own boat. He engineered his own boat. He built his own boat. He lost. He broke the mast. He everything that could have happened happened to him. And then he came in and finished eighth. And and when I think about Nandor, I just I think winner success. So you know, in some ways, it's you know for me, so you know the first part of the success. And you know, Robin tells me every time I see him that you know, I have to finish first. To, to finish first, first you have to finish Thompson, and uh, you know he's absolutely right. So you know, to me, I can't, I couldn't say that if I, you know, to me, if I went, if I finished the race, then that has to be success. And I think if I finish the race, I'm going to be close. That's a good Sir Robin impression, Alex. I'm very impressed with that. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with Robin. <laughs> um. I think if you look at the fleet, I mean, for sure, it's going to be a fast race, isn't it? I mean, I'm interested, Alex, when you're out there, how much are you sailing your own race, you know, lapping the planet as fast as you can? And how much are you looking at your rivals and what they're doing? I mean, you're obviously you're always looking at the rival rivals and what they're doing and, um, you know, trying to see what they're doing, trying to decide should you be... You know, should you be banking and or should you be covering or should you be going off on your own? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. I've, I've never been afraid to do my own thing. Um, and probably this time around, you know, we will see difference in speeds. The polars, the speeds, the potential speeds of the boats will be different. There's no doubt about that. And then when you stick that into a into a routing, we could see very different routes. So, you know, it's very, I think you have to be very careful to, to you know, to, end up in a scenario where you might end up not choosing your optimum route to cover somebody when you could end up in a in 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 a place where it's not perfect for your boat so so you have to so if that makes sense you have to be careful i think um to make sure that uh that you sail to your boat's optimum performance and not get stuck in a duel with somebody who who um who is is sailing in a place where you're not optimum on the other hand, you know, one of the most terrifying things for the Vonday would be to make a serious mistake on day one or two or day one to ten, and and then your whole Vonday could be ruined. So it, it's it's a it's a there's a little bit of chicken and egg there. And in the last Vonday, I was really annoyed with myself. I made a, a big mistake and on at Finisterre, I jibed and and went into the coast, and it was a big mistake, and it cost me a hundred miles. So you know that that side of it can be a bit terrifying really so it, it's it's um i i will certainly be selling my own race this time i imagine you know as much as i possibly can we don't know what the performance of the other boats is we can kind of guess a bit but we don't really know so you know i think we'll just have to continue what we started three years four years ago which is to you know to trust ourselves to you know to continue walking down the path with the knowledge that we have and progressing that and and um be confident you know i don't i think we shouldn't we can hold our heads high we 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 did a good job last time and you know very unfortunate to break a foil we're certainly very conscious of that this time that's a definite you know i i would be surprised if we don't see some hydrofoils breaking in this race and and i'm and i'm really really um working we i will i will it won't be me Shelley. touching wood that, that won't be me this time so, so yeah, it's it's be confident, be bold, and and continue on the path that we've been on. Looking at the rest of the fleet, who do you think will be out there challenging you for the win? Who are your main rivals? Well, it looks to me like um, you know the main guys that are going to be there that um, have got the miles in and and performing well are uh, Jeremy Bayou. Chiral launched, you know, 12 months before anybody else, got the most amount of miles, pretty sensible decision when you look at it now. Um, but he's, he's uh, you know, he's done a, a, a great job, a great preparation. Then you've got Charlie Darlin, you know, comes from the school of Francois Gabar. Uh, done a great job. You know, he's been very competitive to date. Um, yeah, and, and with Francois Gabar behind him, 
You know, I think I think he's got a you know fantastic chance. Thomas Royer, he's done a really good job. Um, obviously, working with with uh, Marcus Hutchinson, and and they've I think they've put together a really good challenge. I think he could be a, a real dangerous competitor. He seems to be improving, improving, improving. So I think they're the three mains, and I'd, I'd like to. I'd like to stick us in there as well with those with those three, so make four of us. And then, you know, Arkea Paprik. Um, they've had a torrid time to, to arrive with broken foils. You know, it's been a difficult preparation for them, but Seb Simon is, seems to be a you know a great sailor. I don't know him well, but he's managed by Vassal Ryu. And Vassal Ryu, in my opinion, was one of the strongest uh, skippers technically that, that Imoka have, have ever had. So I wouldn't rule them out, but I think reliability, you know, I don't know if they've got the miles. And you've got um, L'Occitane, which is uh, obviously a San Maniard, a, a canal, uh, with a totally different foil arrangement, probably the foil with the most amount of writing moment. So that, that would be the boat that in writing moment conditions could absolutely kick ass. So I, I think they've got an outside chance. And then perhaps... Let's look. Go down a bit later. Let, you know, let's go down to Sam on initiatives. I mean, what a great campaign she's done! Like you say, more miles than anybody else. Um, I've been watching Boris Herman with Militia with his new foil. He seems to be able to match, get up and match the speed of the other boat. So, I, I think there are outliers. I don't think that's likely. I think the winner will be probably one of the four. But you know, it could easily be a, a Arkea Patrick. Maybe it could be a, a Corum. I think it's unlikely a Loxitan. So I, that, that's my, my, I would say, obviously us, Jeremy Bell, Charlie Darlin, and uh, and Thomas Royer are the are the favourites. I think it's been a great career, hasn't it, Alex? What would winning this race mean to Alex Thompson? And what on earth is he going to do with his time if he does win it? Who knows, eh? Who knows? Uh, yeah, I don't, you know, it's, like I say, thinking about the winning, you know, that's what we aim for, that's everything, we, that's why we do it, and that's why, you know, you, I entered this competition that, strangely, I really enjoy, um, but, I, you know, I don't, I don't think about it too much, Shirley, you know, it's, it's, um, it's there, but I, I don't want to feel arrogant thinking about that final moment, but you can rest assured, everything I do is it will be at trying to make that happen. With regard to what I do after this, um, no decisions will be made. I would love to go and do the route to rum and, and uh, finish in the correct part of the island without touching any of it. That would definitely be a, a thing I'd like to do in, in two years, in, in, in 2022, put that wrong right. Uh, so that that's probably the next thing that I'd, uh, I'd certainly commit to doing now. Well, Alex, it's been great to chat oh, the best of luck we'll uh, it's going to be an exciting race that's for sure thank you there aren't many people with as much Vendée Globe race experience to my reckoning just French offshore veteran Jean Le Cam has as many Vendée campaigns under his belt as Alex Jean also is about to start his fifth Vendée if all goes well, Alex should very definitely be amongst the leaders in the charge down the Atlantic. And we very much hope to get a full Alex Thompson podcast edition once he's back home. Now, many of you will know that start day at the Vendée Globe is amongst one of my favorite lifetime experiences. If you haven't been, try and make it one day. It's an incredible affair. The vibe and atmosphere in the town intensifies as each day passes climaxing with quite literally hundreds of thousands of visitors flooding into the French port of Le Sable to wave the fleet goodbye. Just thinking about it gives me goosebumps. Filming there for the last edition though I couldn't help but be a little disappointed. Of the 29 entrants to the race back in 2016 the fleet was made up entirely of men. The first two editions of the race in the 1990s were all male affairs. Before in 1997, Catherine Chabu became the first woman to finish the marathon race. Since then, there have been many notable female attempts on the Vendée, 
most notably, of course, Ellen MacArthur's second place finish in 2001. I'm therefore delighted to say that this edition of the race has more women taking part than ever before, with six female skippers hitting the start line. And for our next guest, we're talking to one of the rising stars of the female offshore fleet, 30-year-old Clarisse Kremer. After a year in the French Figaro fleet in 2018, Clarisse attracted the attention of the long-established Bunk Populaire sailing team, the team that masterminded Armel Leclerc's Vendée Globe win in the last edition of the race. She's a Vendée rookie, about to embark on her first circumnavigation. And while she's doing it on a non-foiler, the boat she's sailing actually won the Vendée two editions back with Francois Gabar. I started off by asking Clarisse just how excited she was as start day approaches. <laughs> it's true that I still find it difficult to realize that I'm going to take the start of the Vendée Globe. I, I hope I'm going to realize it at some point because it's going to be necessary very soon. <laughs> I'm, I think it's a pretty normal way to feel. I'm both scared and anxious and nervous and quite excited. It's a very a weird mix of uh, feelings and uh, I'm trying to deal with all of this and um, trying to get to be focused on very uh, uh, normal things of the daily life and um, and the start is going to to happen at some point so <laughs> so yes I'm 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 quite I'm quite uh, I'm quite okay I'm not as stressed as I could uh, have imagined <laughs> <laughs> It's not the start day yet <laughs> Maybe that will come <laughs> Um, you're 30 years old, born just 30 days after the start of the first ever Vendée in 1989, of course. What are your earliest memories of the Vendée? And which Vendée skippers of the past do you really look up to? I think, well, because I was going to take the start of the Vendée Globe, I, I tried to, to have a look at all the stories that happened during the Vendée Globe. But to be really honest, before... Preparing myself for this adventure, I think the very first memories I had of the Vendée Globe were just back to 2001 or something like this with uh, Michel Desjoyeaux, Ellen MacArthur. Um, before that, I can't remember anything. And and the first uh, adventures, I yeah, I don't remember very well um, what happened. I just um, yeah looked, uh, watched all the videos after that, and uh, of course heard about all the stories of. Um, well, the nice stories and the less nice stories of different um, competitors during the Vendée Globe. And uh, I think I look up to almost uh, every guy or girl who did the Vendée Globe. I, I'm, not, um, I, I, I'm not the sort of person who has one idol or who has one uh, skipper uh, that I, I love more than the others. And uh, of course, I identify myself a little bit more to the other girls like Hélène, like, uh, like uh, even to Catherine Chabot or Isabelle Tissier, or most recently, uh, Sam. But um, yeah, I think all the adventures are extraordinary. And even the guys who didn't finish, uh, yeah, all what happened, I think everything is extraordinary. So I'm very happy to have the chance to, to do a, a little bit of this uh, of this story. <laughs> to make your own story. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking forward to that as well. <laughs> You've come through the French offshore sailing, the Mini Transat, the Figaro circuit. Was the Vendée Globe always something that you wanted to do? Well, not really. I think um, for me, it, it, it's very different to, to dream about the Vendée Globe like, uh, like someone who, who watches it who just uh, is is uh, is trying to follow the stories or um and to and to identify to the Vendée Globe as someone who can do it and who can participate in the Vendée Globe and it's very recently that I started to imagine myself doing the Vendée Globe it's only like 2 years ago only a few weeks before uh, Banque Populaire offered me to do this extraordinary adventure with them so um, yeah, I think I'm I'm pretty lucky to to have the chance to participate the, to the Vendée Globe in the Vendée Globe 
only a few years after starting to dream about it. So, so I, I know it's a bit, um, it's not the normal way. Usually you dream about the Vendée Globe for years and uh, eventually you manage to, 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 to take part in this adventure. And for me, it was a bit different because it's not, it's not been so long since I started doing um, offshore racing. And, um, and before that, of course, I just love to see the Vendée Globe and to, to watch everything that happened during the Vendée Globe. But it was so, uh, I don't know how to say it, but far from, from my life. And, and I couldn't identify myself to this uh, challenge. And uh, so it's quite new to me. And, uh, and I know it's a, it's a huge um, chance to, to be able to, to race this uh, incredible race. It must have been quite the moment when, you know, the team, the, the manager of, of Bank Populaire phoned you up. What do you recall of that? Yeah. How did you feel about it? <laughs> I, I was really, really surprised. I was not expecting that at all. Um, when Ronan, so he's the, Ronan Luca is the director, the technical director of uh, Team Bank Populaire. When he called me the first time, I was... Um, I had no clue. I had no idea he was going to offer me this incredible um, uh, project. And I, saw, I thought he was going to ask me to do videos with them because I just, uh, when he called me uh, only a few weeks before, I had done videos with um, Romain Atanasio, who is going to participate in this, uh, in this at Vendée Globe as well. Uh, he, ha he had invited me on his boat to, uh, to be a, a media woman, you know, <laughs> so, so onboard reporter. And, I, and so I thought maybe uh, Ronan wants me to do videos on their, on their boats or something like that. So when he, he, he called me and, and told me, uh, okay, I want to see you, he didn't say anything. And so he waited for us to meet um, in Rio uh, to, to tell me, okay, I have this project. What do you think? And I was like, oh, <laughs> Okay, uh, I don't know what to say, and I was so scared and so um, so surprised that my first reaction was just to make a list of all the reasons why he shouldn't pick me, <laughs> because I wanted him to, I wanted, I wanted to make sure he knew who he was talking to, and uh, and uh, he was not um, having a, the, a wrong image of who I was. <laughs> That's funny. I'm sure he had a list of why he should pick you. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Your team at Bank Popular, of course, they were winners of the last edition, uh, Armel Leclerc skippering Bank Pop in 2017. I mean, how much responsibility do you feel? They are, of course, one of the big, really well-known teams in French offshore. Mm -hmm. Well, it, 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 yeah, I think it's. Um, I think I still don't really realize these kind of things. Um, um, I'm I'm quite lucky because um, we chose a boat. So my boat uh, won the Vendée Globe in 2012 with François Gabard. Um, so it's not a brand new boat. I don't have foils on my boat. So my boat says it all. My boat um, explains what is the uh, overall idea uh, around my project. It's not a project to win. Um, it is a very competitive boat uh, because it's a it's a boat that yeah I think it, it still goes quite fast. It, it's very um, how do you say uh, reliable? Uh, can you say this? Yes, reliable. Um, so I, I love my boat, but it it really explains what the uh, yeah what what we want and what are the the goals of my project. It's just that uh, I'm not here to win. Uh, I'm here to do my first. Uh, Attempts to the Vendée Globe and um, and to go as fast as I can with this incre incredible machine that I have in my hands. But um, so I don't really feel the pressure of having such a huge sponsor of of having Armel, uh, who is the the leader skipper of the of the team. Um, yeah, it's it's just so different from what Bon Populaire is used to do. Usually, like usually they they build boats, they build boats to win. And this time it's a bit different. I think everybody is in the team is is quite happy to do something different um, because they still have this uh, huge uh, multi hull being built at the same time for Amel. So it's a different story, and um, I don't really feel this pressure. And on the contrary, I think it's again a huge chance to to have this team. They are all experts in what they are doing, and they 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 drive me every day. They they know they explain me so many things, and they 
they explain to me so many things and they yeah they they yeah they are just around me all the time and uh, so it's it's more uh, a huge uh, I, uh, do you say luck or chance or I don't know or or privilege or I don't know how how to say this but uh, I don't really feel this pressure <laughs> I'm I'm not sure I should if I should uh, feel it but uh, right now I don't feel it. <laughs> You sailed the transat with Armel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a double-handed offshore race. How much did you learn from him? I mean, he's nicknamed the Jackal and he's one of the, the greatest offshore racers of his generation. How good an experience was that? I think it was just the best way to start my project. I had only a year and a half to prepare to the Vendée Globe. It was uh, my first experience in this huge, on this huge uh, 18 meters boat. And uh, to have Armel as an example, to just uh, be able to sail with him, to be with him on this boat, and to just uh, watch him and participate in the in the in the maneuvers and in everything we have to do on the boat, it was just um, yes, the best way to start. It was um, he knows those well, yeah, he knows how to drive Imokas just uh, perfectly well. He's been sailing on this kind of bus for ten years. He's done three Vendée Globes. He's been always on the podium. He won the last Vendée Globe. He's just the best on this kind of boats and still is the best almost. Um, so, um, yeah, it was just perfect. Armel and I are quite different, but it, everything went very well. And he he never said... Uh, he's a very quiet and calm person. So on the boat, everything was always calm and quiet. And there was no word said for no reason. And um, it was just uh, the, the perfect environment to learn. And uh, I, I think it was just um, the best way to start my project. And I'm not sure I would have been able to learn so much if he had not been here and if it had not been decided to, to start the project that way. Mm. There's not been a, a massive amount of race practice available. Only one big solo race, the Vendée Arctique. How was that? I mean, 3,000 miles, racing hard. How comfortable are you with your preparation? Yeah, I really wish I could have said more before taking the start of this race. Um, the two um, transatlantic races we were supposed to do uh, in uh, May and June were um, would have been perfect. <laughs> I would have been very happy to do them and uh, because they are... Uh, they are quite uh, difficult races to do and um, it would have been the perfect plan, but uh, we had to change our plans. So I'm, I'm still quite happy I was able to do the Vendée Arctique and to do it quite well. And um, yeah, it's always the same for sailors. You always wish you could have done more. And um, so I wish I could have sailed more, but that's it. I, I, now, the I, as we say in French, les, les dés sont jetés. So now this is the the state of my knowledge and uh, I can't do more. So I'm going to take the start this way and, and, um, and that's it. <laughs> As you said, your boat won the race with uh, Francois Gabar in 2013. Um, it's non-foiling, but as we know, you know, it can, it can perform. It's a good solid boat. You know, how competitive do you think you can be? I'm not sure. Um, my first goal is to finish the Vendée Globe, and I think it's quite a big goal. <laughs> so I'm going to to stick to this goal. But um, I am a competitive. Uh, I don't. I'm not sure it, it means the same in English. But uh, I love competition. I love to to compete, and I, I love to always think about what I can do best on my boat and uh, uh, what I can do better on my boat. I mean, and um, and how to go faster. It's always something that I think about and. Uh, it really um, gives me energy uh, in the during the everyday life at sea. It, it's something that's quite important to me. But it's not going to my to be my main goal. Um, maybe I I can be competitive amongst the um, I can be uh, competitive amongst the birds that don't have faults. <laughs> I'm going to say it that that way, and um, so I'm going to try to do that. And uh, one of the what I find incredible is that one of the um, the skippers who are very good uh, among that type of boats is uh, Jean Le Quem, who's done already a, a lot of, uh, of Vendée Globe. So I, I would be very, very, very happy to be able to compete with him. And uh, so we'd see, we'll see what happens. But uh, I, I, I'd be very proud. What are you most concerned about, most nervous? I mean, what's, what's keeping you awake at night? 
um, the technical issues because um, on this kind of boats, uh, life is uh, pretty uh, until you have a technical problem. <laughs> So yeah, um, I, as we've said before, I don't have a huge um, background, and I'm I'm not a very even though I've learned quite a lot in the past years, and even though I uh, I'm trying to learn every day a little bit more about all the technical issues I can have, I still have a lot of things that I, I don't know how to do. So I'm quite scared that I, I wouldn't be able to 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 repair something that is quite easy to repair or. So yeah, it's something that really uh, annoys me, and I, I I wish I'm yeah I hope I'm going to be able to to repair the things I have to repair, and um, so yes, it's really the technical issues that uh, annoy me, and I uh, it, when you take the start of the Vendée Globe, you you know that technical issues are going to happen, and you just hope for the best and hope that you're going to be um, able to to. To to, to 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 find a solution and uh, so but I don't know yet so yeah that's something that annoys me and that's the thing I'm more anxious about. Well, it's been it's been so great to meet you. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. We're really excited for you. I mean, have have the very best race, and uh, I'm very much hoping to to meet you in person at the finish. Thank you, thank you, Shelley. Clarice Kremer taking on the Vendée Globe for the very first time. We wish her all the best. At the beginning of the edition, I mentioned briefly the makeup of the fleet, of how eight of the 33 entrants are newly designed foiling Amoka 60s, sailing this race for the very first time. The massive step up in the use of foils across the sport hasn't passed the Vendée fleet by, and these new bows boast some giant appendages that will surely put that 74-day race record in jeopardy. As well as these new foilers, there are also 11 older boats in the fleet that have seen retrofitted foils, foils added in a bid to create a more competitive boat. In the next episode of the pod, we will be discussing that very concept with Sam Davies as she races in her retrofit initiative Coyer. But we also wanted to delve a little deeper into the design game of the Vendée fleet. So chatted with one of our sport's cutting edge yacht designers. Argentinian naval architect Juan Cumajan has two new boats in this edition's fleet and designed the retro fitting of PRB's foil setup. We talked to him at his home on the south coast of England and I started by asking him how exciting a design project is a Vendée Globe yacht. Uh, well, the, 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 the answer to that question, I think, is to go through history because uh, what it means today is probably slightly different than what it meant at the beginning. Uh, it started as an incredible adventure uh, several decades ago, two and a half decades ago, and, um, and um, the, the, um, back then the Imoca class was very, uh, the, the class of boats that I used on the Vande, it was very different. Um, and it, it was mostly single-handed people that were going around the world as an adventure. Uh, but nowadays, it's almost on the other extreme. I mean, there's still a single-handed uh, race around the world, but the, uh, the Imoca boats have evolved and developed so much that today, fr from a yacht design perspective, it's an incredible um, uh, 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 game to play, if you want to call it a game, uh, around the emo class because it's the only open class that remains that really uh, favors um, development. Uh, so you know, even the even the America's Cup has gone one design in several things. You know, but uh, other than the America's Cup, I think it's the only really game in town for for innovative designers. So. Um, I, I'm enjoying it a lot. I think it's, a, it's very important for uh, yachting and sailing in general. Um, but uh, right now it has become a very high-tech uh, uh, program uh, as much as an adventure for a single-handed solo sailor. You were first involved back in the 2008 edition designing Pinder. What did you make of the race back then and how excited were you to be designing a brand new Vendée boat? Well, uh, it was always exciting to do these boats um, because, like I said, uh, you know, 
it leaves very much freedom of expression to whoever is designing them. In the case of Pindar, it was, it was quite awkward because the boat was never designed for the Van de Globe. In fact, uh, Andrew Pindar um, asked us to design the boat um, to uh, be sail crewed. And he wanted, he, 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 uh, he saw the potential of the Imoka class and he wanted to do a Imoka not for single-handed. So we did that boat for him, uh, but then it got used uh, single-handed, and uh, and so it had to be modified a little bit. But it wasn't the right boat for a single-handed race. But that was the first time we tasted the the Imoka class, and I started going to the uh, meetings in France, the sort of the class meetings, and uh, and you could see that the spirit uh, of innovation is uh, sort of. Uh, in the air, uh, and, uh, and you know, it, it is quite, it is very interesting. Uh, it is a uh, to be part of that Imoka world is 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 probably as as good a challenge for a yacht designer as, as you can find in this planet. You know, it's actually very interesting. Can you remember back then what were the key design decisions? Yeah, well, there's always the um, you know the, the the in terms of the power of the boat writing moment and the, the power of the boat is, is very much a function of how much the crew can deal with it. So when you bring it down to a single-handed guy, the ratio of power uh, to the weight of the boat is different than if you do a boat uh, for crew. So that was the, that was the, the, the key feature to, to have to deal with then is uh, uh, you know, once the Pinder boat got put into a single-handed, coming from a very overpowered world of crew racing, uh, to find out how much you need to sort of tone the boat down uh, to be able to be used by a single guy. And that was quite impressive because you realize that uh, often they cannot go more than 60-70% of the boat's potential. And uh, and so when you are in that world where you're not be able you're not able to push the boat, then displacement becomes key, and you need to be very light, and you end up end up playing a game of how light you can be uh, on on a boat that structurally needs to withstand all these forces around the world. So uh, you know nailing these nailing these variables on the big equation of how how much power and how light you can make it to be also structurally sound. It is a fascinating game, uh, which is a game that all the teams are playing, really. But uh, some will get it better than others. But uh, um, that's when experience comes uh, and helps a lot. You know, there's a, there's some people in the in the class which are very experienced. They already seen things fail for no reason or no apparent reason, and uh, and so uh, it helps a lot to have their their feedback. But but finding that fine line of what is a boat for single-handed uh, in terms of power and, and weight is, is, is key. As we've discussed in this podcast, the, the Vendée has a pretty high attrition rate. Around half the fleet finish each race. Pindar, I think, finished fifth with Brian Thompson. How much of a relief was it to see it you know, get round in one piece? Well, it was it was very much a relief because I never really wanted him to use that boat because he was, as I said, designed for something else. But um, but anyway, so he did, and I think he he struggled quite a bit. I mean, the, the boat was very powerful and heavy, and um, and uh, or powerful, therefore heavy, and therefore and for a single hander it was quite a bit. But it was a relief because uh, I think like two or three days before the finish, he had an issue with um, with one of the pins that holds the, uh, the, the the hydraulic ram, the canting hydraulic ram to the keel, and so that that pin was very much about to let go, and so he had to, and that happened like a few. I don't remember if it was two or three days. He was right at the finish, and uh, and so woof, it was yeah, it was quite a struggle. Um, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot from that experience, as you usually do, and um, and so then we we obviously uh, the, the the boats that we did afterwards were uh, were very different. Certainly, the ones we did uh, recently now. But um, yeah, you always and it will be the same this race. I mean, I think nobody can be certain that it will finish the race. In fact, uh, it's almost like a toss of a coin, and this is the big unknown because. 
nobody has gone around the world in, in one of these new Imocas, you know, and the, the more they've done is, the, you know, gone to Brazil on the Jacques Vabre and so forth. But uh, uh, it's a bit of an unknown what, how they're going to manage those boats uh, in the south and uh, in, 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 in those kind of conditions. So, uh, unfortunately, we start this race with a lot of question marks and, and big unknowns. Hopefully, seamanship would prevail and they will sort it out. But, you know, you cannot design these boats not to break. Or if you do, which I don't think is possible, but even if you attempt to it, you have absolutely no chance of being competitive, you know. So, uh, what do you do, you know? Uh, so you need to play that fine line. Everybody's playing it, and um, hopefully, hopefully they all be okay. You've worked on several other campaigns. Uh, we'll get on to your new boats for the sedition shortly. But before that, one thing that's arisen in recent years offshore, well, everywhere, is foils. I want to know, Juan, there's a lot of Imoka 60s now that were built as non-foilers and now have foils. You've worked with PRB, Kevin Escoffier's boat, converting mm -hmm. her to foils. How much of a design challenge is that retrofit? Uh, I, I actually like it a lot. That, that boat was originally designed by Guillaume Verdier, who did an in, uh, incredible job designing that boat. I mean, that boat is, I don't know how old, but very old. And still uh, very competitive. But when we, uh, when we sort of upgraded that boat, that we, we changed all the ballast configurations and the appendages. Um, but you obviously still have a fuselage that you need to stick to, you know. So um, because of the structure of that boat and because of the unknowns that um, we were facing at the time, we agreed that we were not going to go over a writing moment of 35 ton meters. And this was, at the time, felt like pushing it because the masts, have officially only been designed for a writing moment of 30 ton meters. It says it on the rule, like basically it says, if you go beyond 30 ton meters, you're on your own, you know, like uh, <laughs> it's your problem. So we went to 35 thinking, wow, we're pushing it. And, um, and off comes Charal, <laughs> you know, like at 40 something and you go like, wow, okay, they're pushing it. And, um, and so since then it became a game of, okay, how much you want to dare pushing this power of the boat through the foils, because obviously, uh, that's how you, through the foils, and how you get that kind of writing moment. And, uh, and you know, so it became a game of saying, okay, well, the, the fuse, the weakest link is the mast, so we need to figure this out. But the class has been extremely, not now, but at the beginning, back then, uh, jealous about sharing the information about the mast, because they, 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 they didn't want uh, teams to be able to optimize so much around them. And so they wanted to, to sort of control this arms race to optimize around the fuse, which was the rig and the mast. Um, so we did have some information, but we were sort of blinded um, a bit about how much to push the mast. And we kind of guessed a few load cases that could be uh, relevant and, uh, and convinced ourselves that, you know, pushing up to 42 ton meters of writing moment. Uh, on certain configurations, when you have like a reef and a small head sail, you know, not a mast head sail, that, that the mast will hold that. And, and so we went from 35 to 42. And we seem to be now more or less in the same area where all these new boats are, you know. But on comes uh, uh, L'Occitane uh, with these massive foils. It's pushing like at 50 or probably over 50 or 10 meters at some point. So <laughs> I don't know where the limit is, but... Uh, it seems crazy. Obviously, the, the more bright the moment you're happy to uh, go for, in some conditions, not all conditions, you will, you will go quicker. So, um, you know, it's a bit nerve-wracking because um, it, seems to be, it seems to be very much at the limit of the rigs. Uh, and, you know, single-handed around the world is, is not easy to control. When you get a, when you're under a cloud or you get into a big front single-handed, you know, you just, there's some things you cannot do. Um, you cannot just go and change sails quickly and things like that. So um, the, the rigs will be, and the boats, but the rigs particularly, they'll be pushed to limits that they've never been before. So I hope that we don't have many surprises there. <laughs> You've got two brand new boats in this edition, starting with a blank piece of paper. I mean, how exciting is it to design a brand new foiling Amoka 60. 
No, it's, it's, uh, it's incredible because you start from the first page of the rule, uh, rule 101, I think it is, that says everything that is not explicitly forbidden is therefore allowed, you know. So when you look at that, you go, okay, this is, this is my favorite book, you know, and, and so pff, everything is possible, you know, in a way. Um, and, um, and so it is a true blank sheet of paper, you know, it's a proper, completely blank. Uh, certainly when we started, uh, because we, you know, we, we, we haven't been involved in the last edition. So when they did all this move into foils, we were not part of that. Uh, we, we came late with PR, when we changed PRB. Um, so uh, we had a lot to learn and a lot to catch up. So um, we, we obviously were having a very close look at what the others were doing, particularly Guillaume, uh, who's very smart. And... Um, so we had a close look and, uh, you know, tried to put the problems on the table that we thought were r important to solve. And, uh, and then we solved them. We threw a bunch of uh, R&D to it and, uh, and came out with a bunch of uh, solutions. But there's so many compromises to be done because the theoretical, the, the, the best theoretical boat is, is probably the, op the opposite of what a single-handed guy needs to go around the world. So from those ends, you need to start compromising uh, in, 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 and come out with a solution that tries to fit everything. And so that's where we are. Uh, some boats would have their moments. Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think you can conclude on a, on a boat or a set of foils that actually does everything well. So, you know, you have the best foil for the light air um, sort of uh, reaching and downwind, the, the more... Uh, light air or, 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 or uh, upwind oriented, oriented foils. Uh, and then you have the boats that will take off earlier than the other ones, which, which is a bit like Arkea is doing now, which will be very strong in the medium, but won't have a very uh, high end speed capacity. Then you have boats like um, Apivia or um, uh, particularly Apivia that, that, that uh, would have probably would be later to take off or we would not, would not be so strong in the middle, but would be super strong in the, in the upper range. Uh, you know, um, every boat would have its moment. So, but, and, and they go so fast that, you know, sometimes there'll be some days that a boat will lose a hundred miles. And in the previous Volvo or even in the previous one days, you go, well, you lost a hundred miles in a day. So you are cooked, you know, that's it. You're never going to come back. But these boats go so quick that in a matter of hours you can you can do changes of 50 to 100 miles really quickly. So I think it will be very exciting to watch. And and uh, and some boats, like I said, would have a good day, and others would have a very bad day. But 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 the the wheel will turn constantly, you know. So it would be nice. <laughs> what are the main aspects you look at? I mean, I remember discussing at length with Louis Perron once that the Vendée is a marathon, and the skipper has to be comfortable. I mean, he has to be able to actually exist as a human being whilst racing. So how much is designing a non-stop offshore boat a compromise between speed and, and relative comfort? Uh, it's a good question, which I don't think we found the answer. Uh, in fact, even relative comfort seems like an unobtainable thing nowadays. It's sort of, sort of I think we're all in the race of uh, reducing miscomfort. Um, but you can, you know, you know that it'll be very uncomfortable throughout. But uh, but when we launched the boats, it was simply not not sailable. You know, in over certain conditions, for a single guy, um, the thing just moved and banged just too much. And I mean, it still does. But obviously, they've done some things to mitigate that. But um, but it is an extremely uncomfortable ride, and uh, I don't know how these guys are gonna make it in sort of 50 days or so around the world, 50 something. Um, maybe less if they push. I mean, it's all about how much they can push. But um, uh, it's, it's, the thought is scary. I mean, I, the most I've sailed was three days um, offshore and I just couldn't see the moment to come back on shore, you know. It was like fun for the first day, kind of okay the second day, but by the time you get to the second night, you get me out of here. It's not right, you know. And uh, and so these guys are obviously special guys, and they you have to be born a bit crazy to do it. But uh, it is a big unknown. 
Uh, I think Loic is, uh, is, is right when he points that out. I mean, Loic said to me once, he was really, uh, it's a phrase that uh, always stayed with me. He said, you have, to, you have to eat before you're hungry, sleep before you're tired, and eat before, uh, yeah, sleep before you're tired, and change sails before the wind comes, things. And so that, that marathon game, like you're saying, is, uh, is very true. But it's a big unknown. What kind of performance gains have you seen with the foils? Incredible. I mean, I would, I would say that it, it, when we started sailing Arkea, Paprec, we had the polars of PRB, and sometimes we were easily in 125 to 130%. Uh, so I think that anything between, in, in some conditions, anything between 20 and 30% is very much uh, is there, yes. It's, it's actually quite ridiculous. But some other conditions, the boats are slower because you compromise. Uh, but, but normally where the new boats are slower, it's a small percentage of the conditions you will encounter on the Vendée Globe. No, but in, and, and, and when these boats will be used for the ocean race, that will be another level yet again, because even when you're sailing single-handed uh, or when you're sailing these boats in small crew, you feel that there's a huge amount of potential there which is not being exploited. Uh, simply that uh, you know uh, the thing, the solo sailor imposes a certain rhythm, but the, the moment that the uh, Volvo crews are going to get into one of these, I mean, it's just going to be mind blowing. In the Americas Cup, the, the big foiling breakthrough came when the boats foiled upwind as well as downwind. Are we seeing that? Well, yes, but slightly different. What we're seeing, well, in the, in the America's Cup, they just foil up wind and they still had a level of efficiency, which was incredible because they were sailing very close angles upwind. In fact, when they, when they, when they took off, they closed the angle, you know, and, and so the levels of efficiency were simply ridiculous. We won't see that with the Imocas, but what we will see is that the best VMGs upwind will be at wider angles. So, for example, when an old boat will be sailing upwind in, say, 43 through in angle, uh, a new Imoca foiling would have better VMG at 55 or 60 uh, through in angle and sailing three, four knots quicker. So that's what... The, the, so they will be foiling... Uh, uh, and, and, you know, scheming flying uh, 10, 15 degrees lower, but, but three knots quicker. So the VMG will be equal or better, uh, but the mode of sailing will be different. So that's what we will see. But we won't see like in the catamarans where they were, they were still sailing at very close. I mean, the, the AC-50s in Bermuda, which probably were the most efficient boats that ever been designed, ever. Um, they were sailing uh, with apparent wind angles down to 13, 14 degrees, which is at the very limit of what you can physically... I mean, there's a theoretical limit at uh, 10, 11 degrees. An ice boat, for example, an ice boat that has no uh, friction and can go very, very fast, has a physical limit at about 11, uh, ang- uh, 11 degrees of apparent wind angle beyond which there is n- impossible to create propulsive force. And the... Uh, AC-50s in Bermuda, they were sailing at 13, 14 sometimes, so very much at the limit. And so um, uh, we won't see that. And I don't think we will see that for <laughs> quite a while now. But, um, but yes, the, the game is, is, is certainly uh, about taking off. You know. It can be quite time consuming when it starts the Vendée. I mean, when we've done big stories with people, I've spent a lot more time on my phone throughout the race, checking the tracker, seeing how they're getting on. I mean, do you live the race with your boats? I mean, how much of it do you then follow? A lot, yeah, and it's not easy because, uh, you know, uh, particularly we started with the Volvos in 2005, I think it was, uh, five or six. And uh, so we were following it very closely, not only myself, my whole office is, uh, and it does bug you a lot when you, when you know that the boats are in, in bad weather or they are going into bad weather and, uh, and uh, yeah, it's not nice. I mean, you got to do it. It's the, you know, so when they're not there, you are very passionate about being involved. But when they are struggling or suffering, uh, you go like, oh, shit, why, why did I do that? You know, but uh, um, 
it's part of the game, I suppose. But it, it is it is daunting. Uh, sometimes I get I can't sleep. I get very nervous. Yeah. Last question, Juan. In this edition, who's going to be at the front of the fleet? <laughs> um, I think that the unbiased answer to that question is whoever decides to um, to push the hardest. Because with the Van der Globe, it's going to be about pushing. I mean, there's a lot of boats that have a tremendous potential. Um, so I suppose that they will be the ones that want to make a gain at the beginning and they will be off blazing. And they could make a pretty big leap by the time they get to, um, to the Southern Ocean. Um, which I think it will be the strategy of all the new boats because uh, you don't know what's going to happen in the uh, doldrums. And, uh, you know, getting out of the doldrums first is, is, is it's key to win the race. So I think all these quick boats are going to be pushing hard at the beginning. And, uh, and so, um, because, you know, nobody knows, once you get to the Southern Ocean, it's a big unknown. Nobody knows what's going to, the boat will have to be sailed differently. And so um, I think that all these new boats would want to be first into the Southern Ocean. So I, I, I expect that they will be full on. And then there might be some uh, that would take probably a more conservative approach and, uh, and remain a little bit further back at the beginning, but, but betting on the fact that there'll be some breakages and, and that they will basically be first in Cape Horn. And once you, are, once you have passed Cape Horn, then the, because the, this race has three legs, you know, you have the, the, the leg that goes down, the leg that, that does the Southern Ocean, and then the legs that goes up. So once you are in the in the once you are in Cape Horn, which is the beginning of the third leg, if you will, um, things change completely. So if you made it there, uh, the race is just around the corner. So I suspect that you know the race. I suppose that, that that probably two thirds of the fleet will make it down there, and uh, and so it's a new race that starts in the, in Cape Horn. And uh, um, so even even if you made it, uh, you know. Three, two, three hundred miles behind um, behind the other boat, you still have a very good chance. It it is a, a almost like a chess game, to be honest, but plenty of unknowns. Um, but to answer your question, I think that the the ones that would push harder, which are probably most of the new boats, will be uh, will be fighting very close together uh, to get past, to get out of the doldrums first. We're going to leave our Vondi chat there for this edition, but in part two, we catch up with three more Vondi skippers as they look forward to hitting the start line and taking on the world. As ever, please do let me know what you think about the podcast. As you all know, I'm at Shirley Sale on Instagram and Twitter, or just me on Facebook, and please do remember to like, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you're joining us on. But also, why not get online and take a look at the Vendée start list? The race tracker is always compelling. And when the race gets going, it really becomes seriously addictive. As ever, you've been listening to the tireless work of Tim at Vertigo Films. A big thank you to Tim. Tim's also a massive Vendée fan. He's a little heartbroken not to be there for his fifth edition. Until next time. Thank you so much for listening and sail safe, everyone. This is Castle One. Great off the speaking. Master coming here, Texas coming. We're 1.5 below. Two days here, boys. We're looking at 10 fives and 42. Fives and 42. This is Castle One standing by. Out. Oh.